Um, so I just thought I'd give you a bit of an update and, and an overview about some of the work that we're proposing and some of the work we've done to try and estimate measures of tissue load in, in the wires uh, that the title of this, um, this session kind of suggests. So I've been influenced by the likes of Dennis Carter and Gary Beaupre who for decades have shown the relationship of mechanical forces on regulating the tissues in our body. And so the, the real key thing here is to try and understand these mechanical forces and loads. Um, and so if we can do that, potentially we can design potential in, uh, interventions or treatment strategies. But it represents a problem, of course, because uh, we need to be able to have some way of measuring these loads. And as Irene's kind of suggested, um, surrogates perform um, or, or are often used in the case of, of trying to get to these somewhat difficult parameters. So uh, here's just kind of an idea, of, uh, and I'll walk you through um, a, a process in which you might be interested in, say, fatigue fractures. So fatigue fractures of the tibia are quite common during running. And uh, from a mechanical standpoint, you say, well, there's an overload of the tissue in response to um, the ability to, to recover. And so here, ultimately, uh, cumulative tissue stress is really what's leading to fracture. And so the, the cumulative stress that you get is related to the individual stress or strain that you might experience during every impact, as I already suggested you could do this, uh, with wearable sensors, um, and then of course with uh, coupled with the number of cycles that you experience. Now this, this is where it becomes a bit of a dog's breakfast, I say, it becomes very messy, where you've got lots of factors related to the, the stresses and strains in the bones. Now we can go to some uh, uh, amount of trouble here to do some complicated musculoskeletal modelling to try and look at the stress-strain distribution in, let's say, the tibia here, um, but um, that's all well and good, but we really also need to know the number of cycles, and this is, a, I think, where wearable sensors have a place. So one question I have, and it's a challenge that we have to address, is you know, what level of complexity is required of our computational models here before we can actually get some useful metrics in the field? You know, do we really need to have subject-specific finite element models of every individual participant that we have in our study? Um, that might be overly complex. So here's a you know, typical workflow that we have um, in, in some of the work that we do, where we prescribe geometry, material properties of an individual, have some sense of the kinematics and muscle joint forces to get to the level of tissue strain, and then we want some estimate of, of load exposure. And so there's three kind of main modeling steps here that I'll just talk briefly about. The first is statistical shape modeling, which we're using quite a lot of to get surrogate measures of the, um, of the actual anatomy. Uh, we're using surrogates also, statistical surrogates, to, to, to get closer to the estimates of tissue strain. And then finally, dealing with uncertainty in our data and looking at probabilistic modeling. So first of all, statistical shape modeling. Uh, this is some work that uh, we've published in the past, but this is kind of a workflow that we're using more now to estimate bone geometry and potentially material properties. And we're fortunate to have a large database of um, CT scans. We can then create statistical shape models of those CT data. And if we are presented with new data from, uh, and, and again, this might be a, a new CT scan, we can actually do a very good job of using our shape models to best fit those data. And that's all well and good, again, if you have CT images, but you know, what if you don't have CT images? Um, can you use the shape models to then do, do reasonable predictions? And this was kind of a logical step for us. Um, one nice thing that we've done with these shape models, because we have cortical thickness as well, is we can include that in our shape models. And what you see here are the first three principal components of a shape model of the femur that incorporates not only the outer geometry of the shape, but the, the, the colours represent the thickness of the cortex. And what you see with these modes of variation is you see coupling between the shape and the cortical thickness. So this kind of, even though it's a statistical representation, nicely shows the form function relationships that you expect to see in, in the skeletal tissue. So what we've done with some of these models is we've done some regression and uh, our, our kind of model of choice here is partial least squares regression. And we've done combinations where we say, that what if we take some anthropometry, some morphometry of this of this femur and, and maybe include some things like age, sex, height, and body mass, can we actually then predict the shape as well as the cortical thickness of the bone? And it turns out you can. So these are um, 
data that we've had, again, from our subset, there's 320 femurs in this population. But just if you can estimate the femoral length and the epicondylar width, and you include the uh, epicondylar width, femoral length, and anthropometrical measurements, so age, height, sex, uh, body mass, you can get some pretty good predictions, as you can see here, on the shape as well as the cortical thickness. So now we've got a method, hey, we can just take some anthropometrical measurements, demographic data, and we can actually predict with um, reasonable confidence uh, here what the actual bones are. So that's, that's pretty good and, and we're using that more and more. Um, the, the next type of modelling I want to cover is statistical surrogate. So this is where we might have a, a more complicated model and um, as I kind of presented yesterday, this idea that we can do our uh, traditional motion capture, uh, measure EMG, have EMG driven models to estimate muscle forces, impose that onto a finite element model and get bone strain, and then wrap this whole thing up as a, as a statistical surrogate. And this is something you, you might do on an individual basis. You bring the participant into the lab, you um, have the participant wear some uh, wearable sensors, so I'm used in this case, you might also require some EMG, uh, depending on the sophistication of your model. And the idea is that you go from, um, from IM use directly to strain. Uh, this is, uh, I admit, a challenge, but I think with these methods, we're showing really promise here to be able to do this uh, on an individual basis. So I th think this leads us down a path of, of personalization. Um, just to show you some of these results, um, I don't have the tibia um, data on this, but this is some some work that Vicky Shiv has done in our group, and Vicky's doing um, three-dimensional finite element models of the Achilles tendon, another thing that's, of course, important for runners. And she's nicely shown here that actually it's important to get the geometry right if you want to estimate the stress distributions in this tissue. And so tendon geometry really influences the stress distribution, and we've shown by perturbing material properties here that it influences the total load to failure. So these seem to be um, some pretty important parameters. Um, we've also then added complexity because we're, we're wondering, uh, at a macro scale actually there, there's a fibre twist um, of up to 60 degrees that we see in the fascicles, the collagen arrangement of Achilles tendon, and if you include that in the model it actually changes the stress distribution as well. And so when we saw this we thought, um, well crap, now we've got to you know, suddenly figure out fascicle orientations of the Achilles tendon as well. But it shows you that uh, at some stage you need to understand the complexity of, of the tissue you're dealing with in order to take a step back and say, well, what would be a useful uh, metric here that we could take out into the wild? Uh, and so uh, just briefly then, um, Vicky's gone on, and this is work also with Griffith University, Claudio Pizzolato's done a really nice job here. They're doing real-time muscle force estimates and what we're doing here is then doing a statistical uh, representation of that finite element model. So again, partial least squares regression is our uh, tool of choice. Um, you know, if you have a hammer, you look for a nail and you hit it. Um, so that's what we're doing here. And this is showing prediction errors of, uh, errors of less than 5%, and these models now work in real time. So now we're exploring real time feedback with a very sophisticated finite element model that's subject specific to the individual. Okay, so probabilistic modelling. Um, this is where I, I think it's a, a really interesting idea where you might have some wearable uh, data from a wearable and you really want to have an influence on, on what you might do in terms of training load and exposure. And so this is a, um, a, a fairly common type of model where you have some cumulative load and the load is then accounted for by the number of cycles which you can measure again with wearable sensors and some estimate of the stress. Now this proxy or surrogate for stress might be our complicated finite element model or it could be tibial shock, right? In the case it's something that's really easy to measure. And so a, a, an interesting question here is how accurate do we really need to be? Um, we can have the, the most accurate model in the world but if an individual doesn't actually run or move, um, that doesn't help us to, to predict whether or not that individual's, they probably won't get uh, a, a, a fatigue fracture in the first place. And so Brent Edwards has really pioneered this kind of concept of having uncertainty in the model, adding load exposure, and here he's doing some predictions of, of failure again using a finite element model and looking at um, the cumulative damage that might occur in the tissue and doing predictions to say if you run at various speeds, these are the potential predictions you see in failure. And so what we're trying to do now, and this is a study that I'm involved with, uh, with Irene, looking at basketballers, is trying to then quantify a uh, whole season of data 
uh, using these wearable sensors, couple it with a mechanobiological model and say, can we actually predict changes in bone health? So we're going to use high-res PQCT, looking at metatarsals and distal um, tibia and try and show you know, how complex do our models need to be in order to um, predict bone health. So just in summary, I think a mechanical biological framework is really imperative here. It really adds value to the field of wearable sensors. I think uh, we can do a lot with surrogate models to get high fidelity information and monitoring in the field. Um, Bill's going to follow up here and show exactly um, how well these models work. And I think surrogate modeling um, really will give us an opportunity in the future. Thanks for your um, attention and I look forward to the panel discussion. <coughs>